country you're in or what language you speak, welcome around the world to the hour of the time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, folks, I come to you with a heavy heart for another one, actually two of my predictions. One has come true, one is about to come true. The one that has come true involved the loss of life and the injury of over 500 people. And of course I'm talking about the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York City. As far back as 1989 and ever since I've been predicting major terrorist attacks upon the United States. The primary number one target, New York City. I've said it so many times and so many people attending my lectures listening to my broadcast and who have read my book are familiar with it. I never, never enjoy being right when it involves the loss of life and human injury. Nevertheless, it is another chalk mark on the board and I remain the most accurate predictor of future world events in the history of the world. The one that is about to come true and has not yet is the prediction that I made that the United States would send troops to Yugoslavia. And it appears that that is going to happen in the very near future. Anyway, we will see, won't we? As we move into the new world order, and all of these events are planned to take us directly into one world totalitarian socialist government. To all those people in the city of New York who lost relatives or who had friends or relatives that were injured, I offer you my deepest compassion, sympathy, and I wish that I could tell you that that was the end of it but I can tell you that it is only the beginning. Unless people wake up, it will escalate and there will be more. Don't forget folks, Monday, March 15th, 8 p.m., Lafayette Hotel, 2223 El Cajon Boulevard in San Diego. I'll be there, I'll be giving a three hour presentation entitled, The Sacrificed King, on the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I will connect it directly to the occult worship of Mystery Babylon, the secret societies, and specifically to the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, which really is just the outward form of the old Knights Templar. And I also believe, have reason to believe, that the Sovereign and Military Order of the Knights of Malta was involved, which is just another branch of the old Templar Order. So make sure that you're there. $40 is the admission fee unless you're a CAGI member. Then the admission fee is $30. I managed to negotiate a 25% discount with the people who are putting this on and who have invited me to speak. 
If you're not a CADG member, you can purchase advanced tickets at the Controversial Bookstore in San Diego. If you are a CADG member, you must buy your tickets at the event. That's the only way that uh, we can get you the discount. If you'd like information on this whole conference, it's last the whole weekend. There's a lot of Looney Tunes stuff going on there. There are some good speakers. Uh, my workshop is is uh, Monday night, the last one of the whole conference. And it's not a workshop ticket, so it's a, it's a separate event altogether. But you can call and find out about the whole thing just in case you want to go and spend the whole weekend. Call area code 619-492-8588. That's 619-492-8588. And we still need donations to pay for this airtime, folks. Come on, get out your checkbooks and your money orders and help us out here. Send your donation to Stan and make the checks or money orders out to WWCR, not to me. I don't want your money. It goes to pay for airtime. That's it, period. Send them to Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Stan, P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Tell him Bill sent you. <laughs> and while you're at it, and even if you don't send a donation, write to Stan or call him and uh, tell him you'd like to receive a packet of information. He'll be glad to send it to you. If you'd like to call him, his number is 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Please call him during normal waking hours. Stan's getting up there, and he likes to get his sleep, and I don't blame him. So please don't call him uh, late in the evening or late at night. Let him uh, have some, some of his own time. Call him during the day, during normal waking hours or early evening, please. Thank you very much for those of you who are doing that. Those of you who are not, please start. Well, let's continue where we left off, and uh, this is about the society in the Middle East known as the Assassins, and we covered quite a bit of their history already, but this secret society, the most successful of secret societies, showed that its strength ultimately depended upon a powerful leader. Well, Kia Muhammad was no such leader. And little by little it became obvious that his own son, Hassan the Hated, was the stronger personality. Now remember, Kia Muhammad was the old man of the mountain, and the mountain lair was called the Eagle's Nest. Now Hassan, through some magnetic power, was able to capture the imagination of the assassins, soon having it believed that he himself was none other than the power of all powers, the hidden imam, who had been mentioned by the first Grand Master, an incarnation of all greatness. So important was Hassan that he was the fountain of power, and others only held a very small measure of authority because he allowed them to have it and for no other reason. This final absurdity was lapped up by members who had been conditioned to believe in things which were not, shall we say, exactly self-evident to the ordinary man. The doctrine of the all-powerful, invisible imam was a part of Ishmaelism, and Hassan was ready, even during his early manhood, to assume the role. But since his father was able to assert himself by having some 250 of Hassan's followers murdered, he thought it wiser to hold his hand. In 1163, his chance came. Muhammad died, and Hassan II issued an order to all Ishmaelis to collect below the castle of Alamut. Never before had such an assembly of killers, fanatics, and dedicated perverters of the truth been seen. Hassan, probably in a state of megalomania, 
assured them that he had received a message from the Almighty, that is, from now, all the bonds of religion were loosed. Everyone might do as he liked. Later, in the modern age, we were to hear that again as, quote, the whole of the law shall be do as thou wilt, unquote. It was not necessary, he said, to keep up pretenses. And furthermore, he, Hassan, was none other than the hidden imam. His word was law. And he was a form of the divinity, not merely relaying instructions from above, but the divinity. Now there was one further obstacle, folks. According to Ismaili doctrine, the hidden imam was to be of the family of Hashim, the blood of Muhammad the prophet. Such descendants were known and revered, and it was common knowledge that Hassan, too, was not one of them. He overcame this difficulty by stating that he was not, in fact, the true son of Kia Muhammad, the Persian, but an adopted child of the Caliphial family of Egypt. This pretense was carried on for four years, during which the crazed Hassan showed that he was not as mad as he might have been, by consolidating quite efficiently the power of the cult. Eventually, he was assassinated by his brother-in-law, Namwar the Famous. Now the father to son succession seemed to be established. Muhammad II, son of Hassan II, began the cultivation of letters and sciences, which was to distinguish successive grandmasters of the order. It was a conceit of his in the time of the greatest flowering of Persian literature that he, he, was supreme among poets and philosophers. He used his assassins also to drive this point well home. The Imam Razi, one of the greatest thinkers of the time, refused to acknowledge the assassins as the most advanced theologians, so Muhammad II sent an envoy to him promising either a swift death by dagger or a pension of several thousand gold pieces a year. Suddenly, oh yes, suddenly, the learned Imam's discourses seemed to lose their bite. One day soon afterwards he was asked why he did not attack the assassins as of old. Because, said the old man with a nervous glance around the assembly where a murderer might lurk, their arguments are so sharp and pointed, and indeed they were. For thirty-five years, Mohammed II ruled the Ismailis with a rod of iron. The only law was that of obedience to the assassin will. The observances of ritual Islam were abolished. A new star had risen, remember that star? a power to stiffen resistance to crusader penetration. Saladin, who was to become an implacable foe of the assassins. The Syrian branch of the cult grew in power, while the activities of the eastern assassins were carried out much more quietly, with missionaries being sent to India, Afghanistan, even the remote Pamir Mountains which straddle China and Russia, where even today adherents of the sect are to be found. Saladin had overcome the other Ismaili branch, the original home of assassin Egypt, and restored the true faith to the people of the Nile. He now had enough booty for ten years' war against the Crusaders in Palestine and troops to spare. His first task was to unify the forces of Islam, and this he determined to do by force, if necessary. Sinan, ancient of the assassin cult in Syria, decided to oppose this terrible enemy of the Fatimites. Three assassins fell upon Saladin and nearly killed him. This made the sect a priority target for the Saracen chief. The old man of the mountain, for his part, who was now Muhammad II, now unleashed a succession of fanatics and every kind of disguise upon Saladin. And by 1176, Saladin decided that an end must be put to the cult. He invaded their territory and started to lay it waste when the assassin chief offered him freedom of action to fight the crusaders and no, no further attempt upon his life if the cult were spared. Now these terms were agreed to and henceforth no assassin ever again attempted to molest Sultan Saladin. 
this period introduces Sinan as yet another strange and terrible assassin leader. For he had decided that he was the incarnation of all power and deity and that he would live the part. Sinan was never seen to eat or drink, sleep, or even to spit. Now, can you imagine this? A living human being never seen to eat or drink, sleep, or even to spit. Between sunrise and sunset, he stood on a pinnacle of rock, dressed in a hair shirt, and preached his own power and glory to delighted assassins. Have you ever worn a hair shirt? Have you ever stood on a pinnacle of rock between sunrise and sunset? I mean every sunrise and sunset? And wearing a hair shirt every sunrise and sunset? Well, folks, this is historic fact. This is not something that someone made up. Thus, at one and the same time, there were two chiefs of the order, each busily telling his own followers that he and he alone was God. Was God. Hassan in Persia, Sinan in Syria, each commanded legions of devoted killers, all committed by oath to follow his path. When Muhammad II died, he was succeeded by his son, Jaluluddin, who completely reversed the orders that the assassins were to have no outward religious observances. You see, he felt that he could do a great deal by adopting the cloak of orthodox piety and sent ambassadors far and wide to announce his maintenance of the true faith. He went so far as to curse his predecessors publicly in order to convince the incredulous that such a people as the assassins could turn over a new leaf as a result of what would today be called a long-term and comprehensive propaganda plan he was acknowledged as a religious leader by half the orthodox monarchs of islam and the first assassin to be so styled and came to be termed prince jalaluddin jalaluddin died in 1203 after 12 years of leadership of the cult handing over to aladdin or aladdin and you guys thought that was just a storybook tale, didn't you? Aladdin, a child of nine years of age, weak, inefficient, stupid, Aladdin made little mark upon history, except in the classic tales of Arabia. The 1001 Arabian Nights. For Aladdin in the 1001 Arabian Nights is Aladdin, the leader of the assassins. It is said that his main activity was tending sheep, to which he was passionately attached, and he even had a small hut built in a sheepfold where he spent most of his time. Aladdin was extraordinarily cruel, in spite of the contact with the sheep, and continued to terrorize in time-honored fashion any person, great or small, who did not pay tribute or otherwise cooperate with the organization. And even today, those in power who are in contact with sheep most of the time <laughs> ultimately turn out to be the same. And we all know who the sheeple are, don't we? The assassin's hands, ears, and eyes were everywhere. Once fully initiated, a man might be sent to a place a thousand miles away to take up residence and live, waiting for the moment when orders came to him from Alamut to fulfill his fatal destiny, and all the while in between, furnishing intelligence to the central headquarters of the assassins. A story is told of the court of the Shah of Khwarizm. Thus, quote, the Ismaili ambassador spent some time with Vigier one day after a splendid van banquet when the wine, which they had been drinking in violation of the law, had mounted into their heads. The ambassador told the Vigier by way of confidence that there were several Ismailis among the pages, grooms, guards, and other persons who were immediately about the sultan. The vigier, dismayed, and at the same time curious to know who these dangerous attendants were, besought the ambassador to point them out to him, giving him his napkin as a pledge that nothing evil should happen to them. Instantly, at a sign from the envoy, five of the persons who were attendants in the chamber stepped forth, avowing themselves to be concealed assassins. On such a day, and at such an hour, said one of them, an Indian 
to the vigier, I might have slain thee without being seen or punished, and if I did not do so, it was only because I had no orders from my superiors. Unquote. The vigier, of course, begged for his life, but word got to the sultan, who ordered the assassins to be apprehended and burned alive, and the five chamberlains were cast on the flaming pyre where they died exulting at being found worthy to suffer in the service of the great sheik of the mountain. So powerful was their devotion to the cult. The assassins had the last laugh, for an order arrived immediately afterwards from Alamut that the Shah must pay 10,000 pieces of gold as compensation for each man killed, which he did, or be killed himself. Another subsidiary activity which the assassins delighted in was the holding captive of Alamut of useful, rare, and distinguished personages who could be of value to them in educational, military, or other spheres, and one was a physician, another a famous astronomer, a third the greatest painter in Persia who worked to the order of the chief alone. The end of a chapter was near. For the Mongol hordes under Halaku, lieutenant of Chinggis, were steadily destroying all the civilization of Islam which lay in their inexorable path westwards. Ruknidin, son of Aladdin, succeeded him and tried at first to turn the Mongol tide. After a series of encounters, pitched battles, intrigues, and counter-intrigues, Ruknidin was taken. He played for time as long as he could but he was eventually murdered in his own turn by the victorious Mongol chief's men. Assassin power in Persia was broken, and what remained of the members were ordered, none knows by whom, to conceal their faith and await a signal that the cult was in full operation again. Alamut was silenced, and the Syrian headquarters alone remained. And if it had not been for the refusal of the Christian kings in Europe to send ambassadors to make a treaty for a new crusade with the Mongol horde, then all of Islam would have been decimated. But it was not. For the Christian kings, even though they would have liked to regain their foothold, in the Middle East, had problems of their own and ignored the Mongol emissaries. It was a long time until the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt was able to overcome the Mongol thrust. In 1260, however, he carried the banners of Islam victoriously against them and restored the fortress of Alamut and other properties to the assassins, who were strongly surviving underground. They soon found that they had exchanged one master for another, for the Egyptians were now employing them for their own purposes and required them to undergo a new initiation, that of the ancient Egyptian mysteries of Babylon. Ibn Battuta, the great traveler of the 14th century, found them well entrenched in their former strong places, being used as the, quote, arrows of the sultan of Egypt with which he reaches his enemies, unquote. The supposed suppression of the creed which followed the Mongol destruction did not, in fact, take place. Copying each other, historians <laughs> have asserted that assassinism died 600 years ago. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now and again, however, fresh facts of their continued existence still come to light. In the 18th century, an Englishman, the British consul at Aleppo in Syria, was at pains to make this better known. He said, quote, Some authors assert that these people were entirely extirpated in the 13th century by the Tartars, but I, who have lived so long in this infernal place, will venture to affirm that some of their spawns still exist in the mountains that surround us, for nothing is so cruel, barbarous, and execrable that is not acted and even gloried in by these cursed assassins, unquote. The assassins were widely dispersed throughout Asia. The rise of the thugs, the secret society of assassination of India, followed the Mongol invasion of Persia. Indeed, at least one of the thug recognition signals, Ali Baha'i Salam, indicates salutations to Ali, the descendant of the Prophet most greatly revered by the assassins. 
Ishmaelis, not all of them recognizing the one chief, reside in places as far apart as Malaya, East Africa, and Ceylon. They would not necessarily feel that they are assassins in the same sense as the extremists who followed the old sheiks of the mountains, but at least some of them revere the descendants of the lords of Alamut to the extent of deification. The modern phase of Ishmaelism dates from 1810 when the French consul at Aleppo found that the assassins in Persia recognized as their divinely inspired chief a reputed descendant of the fourth grand master of Alamut who then lived at Kek, a small village between Isfahan and Tehran. This Shah, Kalilullah, Quote, was revered almost like a god and credited with the power of working miracles. The followers of Kalilullah would, when he pared his nails, fight for the clippings. The water in which he washed became holy water. The sect next appeared to the public gaze through an odd happening. In 1866, a law case was decided in Bombay. There is in that city a large community of commercial men known as Kohas. A Persian, the record tells us, Aga Khan, Mehalati, a native of Mehalat, a place situate near Kek, had sent an agent to Bombay to claim from the Kojas the annual tribute due from them to him and amounting to about 10,000 English pounds. The claim was resisted, and the British court was appealed to by Aga Khan. Sir Joseph Arnold investigated his claim. The Aga proved his pedigree, showing that he had descended in a direct line from the fourth Grand Master of Alamut, and Sir Joseph declared it proved. And it was further demonstrated by the trial that the Kohas were members of the ancient sect of the Assassins to which sect they had been converted 400 years before by an Ishmaelite missionary who composed a work which has remained the sacred book of the Koshas. In the first Afghan war, the then Aga Khan contributed a force of light cavalry to the British forces. For this he was awarded a pension. Hitti, in his History of the Arabs, notes, page 448, in 1951 edition, that the assassin sect known as Kodhas and Malwas gave over a tenth of their revenues to the Aga Khan, who spends most of his time as a sportsman between Paris and London. The influence of the new form of organization and training, as well as initiatory techniques of the assassins upon later societies, has been remarked by a number of students, and I have found in my research that it's absolutely true. That the Crusaders knew a good deal about the Ishmaelis is shown from the detailed descriptions of them which survive. Esh Amir Ali, an Orientalist of considerable repute, goes further in his assessment. Quote, from the Ishmaelis, the Crusaders borrowed the conception which which led to the formation of all the secret societies, religious and secular, of Europe. The institutions of Templars and Hospitalis, the Society of Jesus, founded by Ignatius Loyola, composed by a body of men whose devotion to their cause can hardly be surpassed in our time. The ferocious Dominicans, the milder Franciscans, may all be traced either to Cairo or to Alamut. The Knights Templar, especially, with their system of Grand Masters, Grand Priors, and religious devotees and their degrees of initiation bear the strongest analogy. In the year 1110, a mysterious order called the Priory de Sion appeared upon the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This mysterious secret order, the Priory de Sion, was eventually to crown the first king, the first Christian king of Jerusalem. When they appeared on the Temple Mount in 1110, they recruited nine knights to comb, to scour the Temple Mount, the passages and caverns and tunnels beneath for the ancient remains of the relics of the religion. Later, in A.D. 1118, nine knights, supposedly concerned for the welfare of pilgrims to the Holy Land, bound themselves together in the creation of a knightly order. This order again, existing of nine knights, just like the original nine knights, were commissioned by the Priory de Sion. In under 200 years, folks, this organization had become one of the most powerful single entities, if not the greatest power ever to exist in Europe. They were the first international bankers. The first that ever existed in the world. 
A few years later, it was utterly destroyed. They say, however, as you're going to find out, they were not destroyed at all, but merely driven underground. The zeal of religion, the conditioning which made men support a dedicated cause with all of their might, was likewise the instrument of their destruction. Nothing less than religious fervor could have smashed the order as nothing less could have created it. And folks, you're going to find it difficult to believe, but the rise of this order and the destruction, at least publicly, of this order has such a great bearing on events today that you could say that everything that has happened since has been brought about by this one series of acts. Were the Knights Templar devil worshippers, secret Saracens indulging in obscene orgies? Did they adore a head, spit on the cross, use the words Yala, which means literally in Arabic, O Allah, in their rituals? Did they learn their ways from the terrible sect of the Assassins? Well, yes, folks, they did. And they are the link at least in that day would have been considered the modern link between the ancient mystery religion of Babylon and Europe. For the religion had come to Europe long, long before the Templars ever emerged and made their appearance in the ancient worship of the sun by the Druids and the Celts and the tribes, the Germanic tribes, who had made their way thousands of years ago from the Middle East up through Asia and across Russia and into Europe. They brought mystery Babylon with them and practiced it as what we know now today as the pagan religion. And Stonehenge is actually an ancient Babylonian temple of the sun. And you will find how all this connects later. But the origin of this was lost, and the ability to control large numbers of people by the use of the hidden knowledge of the ages was lost. It wasn't until the Knights Templar bought and brought the mystery religion of Babylon to Europe that the ancient ancient worship of the sun again took hold amongst the Christian countries in the guise of Christianity which was itself at that time I'm not talking about the teachings of Christ now I'm talking about the perversion of the teachings of Christ the melding of the teachings of Christ with the ancient worship of the sun the mystery religion of Babylon which became the Catholic Church was indeed another branch of the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. Now some of you out there may be confused on all of this. If you've been listening from the beginning of this series, then you're right on target. You're not confused. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've picked up this series somewhere in the middle, then you need to call Stan and order the studio quality tapes. They're in stereo. They're on TDK tapes. They are first quality tapes and crystal clear. You need to order this series from the first tape, the very first. And that was broadcast on February the 12th, I believe, a Friday. But anyway, Stan will know. Give him a call at 602-567-6109. That's 602-567-6109. Or write to Stan and ask him for an information packet at P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's P.O. Box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. Now, folks, the original objective of the Order of the Temple, the Knights Templar, which immediately became the subject of applause throughout Christendom, was to combine the two functions of monk and knight, 
to live chastely and fight the Saracens with the sword and spirit. The sweet mother of God, <clears throat> at least outwardly, they say, was chosen as their patroness, and they bound themselves to live in accordance with the rules of St. Augustine, electing as their first leader Hugh de Payens. Now King Baldwin II granted them a part of his palace to live in and gave them a grant towards their upkeep. Now the part of the palace that they lived in was actually an ancient mosque which was built upon the actual location of the old Temple of Solomon on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Knights Templar vowed to consecrate their swords, arms, strength, and lives to the defense of the mysteries of the Christian faith, to pay complete and utter obedience to the orders of the Grand Master, to fight whenever commanded, regardless of pearls, for the faith of Christ as they understood it. Among the vows taken were those which forbade their yielding even a foot of land to the enemy, whoever the enemy was, and not to retreat, even if attacked, in the proportion of three to one. They chose the name Militia Templi Soldiers of the Temple after the temple supposedly built by Solomon in Jerusalem near which they had been assigned quarters by the king but in reality had nothing to do with the Temple of Solomon. Some say that the Templars derived their idea of their order from that of the Hospitallers who looked after Catholic pilgrims to Palestine for there was little hospitality to be had from the native Orthodox Christians of those parts. Others hold that there was an even older order from which they received their inspiration. No reliable evidence on this point is, however, available according to the, quote, establishment, unquote, historians, although for those who really, really research the true history of the secret orders, and specifically the Knights Templars, there's a direct connection to the assassins and the Roshaniya. Although the Templars were so poor that two men had to share a horse, they say, but that is not true at all, and their seal commemorated this decades after they became one of the richest communities of their time, they soon attracted favorable notice and support. Now, the two knights riding the horse was a symbol of sacrifice. It denoted their vows of poverty. In truth, each knight not only had a horse, but he had what they called a yeoman. He had a spare horse. He had a pack horse. And he had several horses in reserve and a whole train of servants. But the Knights Templar were the first true, as we know it, in modern times. In modern times, there were others before. But they are the first true in modern times. By modern, I say, from the time that Europe escaped from the old tribal paganism. In other words, in the year 1110, I consider that the beginning of the modern age, although historians may disagree with me, it's the beginning of everything that's ever happened since and everything that's happening today can be traced right to the door of the Knights Templar. And that's why I say that. They were the first modern order to practice what we now know as true communism. They were the ones who brought international socialism into Europe, which has always been the tenet and the creed of the mystery religion of Babylon. Only one year after their establishment, Falk, Count of Anjou, who had come to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, joined as a married member and gave them an annual grant of 30 pounds of silver. This example was soon followed by other devout Western princes. For the first nine years of their existence, the knights continued to live a life of chastity and poverty in accordance with their vows. They adopted a striped white and black banner called the Boussant, after their original piebald horse, and this word also became their battle cry. Special raiment they had none, and they wore whatever clothes were given to them by the pious, but little by little, as one writer puts it, they were to become haughty and insolent. 
and the black and white banner, the translation of the meaning of which was for the, again, exoteric, for the real meaning of the black and white banner was the meaning of the androgynous God, the positive, the negative, the black and the white, the yin and the yang. The male and the female combined into one, and that was the real meaning of the black and white banner. And it's carried forth today on the floor of many of the temples of Freemasonry where the black and white checkered pattern exists. And in one famous cathedral in Europe, built by the Knights Templar, they disguised their esoteric religion in an exoteric manner that would be accepted by Christianity. Baldwin of Jerusalem, who had been a prisoner in the hands of the Saracens and knew of their disunity, realized at about this time that Islam must eventually unite against the Christian invasion, and he decided that the Templars would prove ideal allies in the battles which were to come. In 1127, therefore, he sent two Templars with his strong recommendation to the Pope, applying for official recognition of the order by the Holy See. And this is the first time that the Templars even were considered to be close to the center of religion, the Christian religion in that day, the Catholic Church, the Pope, for they were not commissioned as a Christian order. They were not commissioned by the Pope or by the Church. And this is a big myth that the Knights Templar started out to protect the Church and protect the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. They were established first, primarily, and foremost as a branch of the ancient order of the religion of Mystery Babylon. And it's indicative of the strategies that they've used since to endear themselves to whatever the established power or the beliefs of the majority of the people might be. When they went to see the Pope, they had an introduction to St. Bernard himself, the abbot of Clairvaux, who was known to be an admirer of theirs and who was a nephew of one of their envoys. Then the Grand Master himself arrived in Europe and received the eulogistic opinion of the abbot. Quote, they go not headlong into battle, but with care and foresight, peacefully, as true children of Israel. But as soon as the fight is begun, they rush without delay upon the foe and know no fear. One is often put to flight a thousand, two, ten thousand, gentler than lambs and grimmer than lions. Theirs is the mildness of monks and the valor of the night." Unquote. Now, folks, this was a strong recommendation, and this testimonial was a part of the campaign to help the Templars in their efforts at recognition by the Pope. All of you who have thought that they began as a religious order in the first place are so way off base that it's pathetic. And neither were the Jesuits a religious order in the first place, but we'll get that together in another broadcast. But on the 31st of January in the year 1128, the Master appeared before the Council of Troyes. Now this formidable body consisted of the Archbishops of Reims and Sins, ten bishops, and a number of abbots, including St. Bernard himself, presided over by the Cardinal of Albano, the Papal Legate. They were approved, and Pope Honorius chose for them a white mantle, completely plain. The red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. And see, you thought the Templars thought of this. Nope, not at all. This was mandated by two popes. First, a white mantle, completely plain, and then later, the red cross was added by order of Pope Eugenius III in 1146. Hugh de Payens now took his delegation through France and England and collected a number of recruits. Gifts and grants were showered upon the order. Lands, rents, and arms were forthcoming from all quarters. 
Richard I of England was enthusiastic about them. By 1133, King Alfonso of Aragon and Navarre, who had fought the Spanish Moors in 29 battles, had willed his country to them. Although when the Moors finally laid him low, his nobles prevented the Templars from claiming their rights, nevertheless, this was, was a great honor. In fact, it, to my knowledge and to our research into history, it had never before been done. In 1129, the master, accompanied by 300 knights recruited from the noblest houses of Europe, led a huge train of pilgrims to the Holy Land. It was at this time that the Templars formed part of the Christian contingent, which allied with the assassins tried to take Damascus. And it wasn't the first time nor the last that the Christian Knights Templar, or supposedly Christian Knights Templar, they really weren't Christian at all, were allied with the assassins. Were they, as the Orientalist von Hammer alleges, connected in some secret way with the assassins? Yes, our research shows that it is a historical fact. And it is also an historical fact that the assassins were prepared to adopt Christianity if they could gain greater power thereby. Christianity, that is, on the surface, just as the Knights Templar had done. Hammer points to the similarity of the two organizations. The followers of Hassan Ibn Sabah were in contact with the Templars and had a similar method of organization. They were in existence before the Templars were formed. The Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelians, or assassins, was the original. And folks, the order of the Templars was the copy. The balance of Western opinion is against this contention, more particularly because one feels from wide reading of historians great sympathy is felt for the cruel, cruelly treated and arbitrarily disposed Templars. Thus, Kitely, who made a close study of the order, attacks those who would claim that the Templars were an assassin branch, but when you do research into the <laughs> associations and memberships of Kitely, you'll find that Kitely was himself a Knight Templar. And he said, quote, When nearly 30 years after their institution, the Pope gave them permission to wear a cross on their mantle, like the rival Hospitaller Order, no color could present itself so well suited to those who daily and hourly exposed themselves to martyrdom as that of blood, in which there was so much of what was symbolical. With respect to internal organization at will, we apprehend, be always found that this is for the most part of the growth of time and the product of circumstances, and is always nearly the same where these last are similar, unquote. And you find this kind of rhetoric and semantics all through the writings of those who wish to cover the true origin and the true meaning of Mystery Babylon. The famous question of the 3,000 gold pieces paid by the Syrian branch of the assassins to the Templars is another matter, which has, of course, never been settled. One opinion holds that this money was given as a tribute to the Christians, the other that it was a secret allowance from the larger to the smaller organization, which it really was, as the assassins wished to expand their control and remember, their original goal was to take over the entire world by the systematic infiltration and control of each individual country. Those who think that the assassins were just fanatical Muslims and therefore would not form any alliance with those who to them were infidels, should be reminded that to the followers of the old man of the mountain, only he was right, and the Saracens who were fighting the holy war for Allah against the Crusaders were as bad as anyone else who did not accept the assassin doctrine. And it is true today. Quote, if you are not one of us, you are nothing. Unquote. Quote, the ends justify the means, unquote. Quote, the strength of our order exists in the fact 
that we manifest ourselves under many different names and many different occupations and sometimes even seem to oppose ourselves. But at the highest level, we are of one mind, unquote. And I could go on and on and on, and you all know that I can go on and on and on, for I've studied this for so many years that I eat, drink, and sleep it. Oh, yes. Well, eventually grave charges against the Templars during the Crusades included the allegation that they were fighting for themselves alone. And more than one historical incident bears this out. The Christians had besieged the town of Ascalon in 1153 and were engaged upon burning down the walls with large piles of inflammable materials. Part of the wall fell after a whole night of this burning. The Christian army was about to enter when the master of the temple, Bernard de Tremelia, claimed the right to take the town himself. And this was because the first contingent into a conquered town had the whole spoils. As it happened, the garrison rallied and killed the Templars, closing the breach. There seemed good grounds for believing that the power which they had gained caused the Templars to devote their efforts as much as their own order's welfare as to the cause of the cross, in spite of their tremendous sacrifices for that cause. Having no loyalty to any territorial chief, they obeyed their master alone, and hence no softening political pressure could be put upon them. Well, this might well have led to an idea that they were an invisible super-state, and that is exactly the fact. But this does show some similarity with the invisible empire of the assassins. If none can deny their bravery, their high-handedness and exclusivity, and less than a hundred and fifty years after their founding gave them the reputation of considering themselves almost a law unto themselves. And now, dear listeners, we get into the meat the direct connection between the historical events and the events that are happening today. Don't miss even one episode 